welcome back. So now we have uh, the fourth lecture, right, That's by right. Sakura on uh, non-invertible symmetries. Please Great. go ahead. Thank you. Okay, so at the end of last lecture, I think we've come sort of to the point where we had discussed uh, a construction of non-invertible symmetries using these stacking of TQFTs and engaging. So these are these theta defects. And we did this in particular in 3D where we got these two rep G0 defects and they were essentially, you can think of them as condensation defects. And in general D dimensions, you can imagine that there's sort of a notion where you have a D minus one higher representation of this group. And here I put a little zero in because this is sort of the subtlety that once you hit, for example, um, three fusion categories and you're actually stacking 3D TQFTs, then this goes actually beyond T the SPT phases, right? So this was sort of characterized, the, the, the defects here had SPTs and actually when you have um, higher reps, uh, you could have sort of non-trivial uh, things. And in fact, they're sort of G-graded higher fusion categories. That's sort of the general structure. So this is for SPTs, that, that zero is indicating that. And then I also discussed one example of twisted theta defects. And that's really this construction of Kaidiomori and Zing where you had a, an anomaly and a Toft anomaly between zero and one form symmetry and the non-invertible came by actually stacking now a TQFT that was a U1 level entry on Simon's theory. And that's sort of a slightly different class of non-invertibles in the sense that these ones here have an interpretation in terms of condensation, so higher gauging, whereas these ones here do not in general. There's also something which I will not have really time to get to, which are duality defects. I think it's okay not to discuss them because I think that's maybe one of the most intuitively constructible things and you can read the papers by, by Choi, Cordova, Sin Lam, and Chao, and this construction actually gives uh, sort of the same defects in a slightly different way. So, and that's sort of inspired by this Kramer's Vanier duality I discussed at the beginning in lecture one. So here you have a theory, just to give you the brief idea, you have a theory that has a self-duality, and then you can essentially gauge on a half space, and then this co-dimension one defect sort of wall that separates the theory from its gauged version becomes essentially this sort of non-invertible defect. There are also these disconnected gauge groups. So I illustrated for you the O2, and then there are also loads of other examples. For example, the pin plus gauge theories in any dimension, really. Um, and that's something that you can also, sort of now I think I, you have some idea of how to now access the papers um, when you just ask them as a layout. Anyway, so there are lots of constructions. And so when I asked at the end of last lecture what you want me to perhaps focus on in the remaining lecture, was half, how do you realize these type of generalized symmetries also non-invertible symmetries in holography. And the other thing was, how do you realize generalized charges? There's still something wrong, right? I mean, you can hear me? Oh, yeah, okay. Good, so let's actually, um, so we have talked about quantum field theories, and many quantum field theories that we like have holographic duals, including the one that had these peculiar twisted theta defects, these non-invertibles for a large enough SUN. So one question you could ask yourself is, in particular, a lot of you do holography, um, how do you realize these types of things in, uh, in a holographic setting? So if you actually, so this, this is sort of an intercept, sort of a, a question you could ask yourself is, given a QFT with some global symmetry, maybe non-invertible or invertible. Generalized symmetry. Um, and let's say this theory 
with a holographic dual. description uh, how do you actually Im incorporate the symmetry structures in holography uh, how is how is let's say the symmetry call it s uh, how is s encoded in the bulk? Well, it's a natural question. And in many instances, this is, well, I thought well known, but then it turns out many people don't know it. But it might be actually something useful to uh, describe. So let's consider our vanilla um, ADS5 times S5 dual to CFT4 set up, but this is not necessarily limited to CFTs. Right? So the, the, the example I'll talk about also for the non-invertibles will be uh, 14 equals to 1, so that's not conformal, but there's still a holographic dual to some extent. So we have 14 equals to 4, super young mills. And, well, let's say with gauge algebra, SUN. Now, how in this dual do you encode the fact that you actually want to discuss SUN or maybe a PSUN superangles? And, you know, maybe that's a question you have not asked yourself before, but it's certainly an important question how you would encode that. And this is something that already Witten tells us in 98, and this t topological field theory in ADS-CFT paper. And it's a very beautiful story, which actually underlies a lot of these symmetry structures already. So the key is, um, look at the bulk couplings that are topological couplings. Right, so what we're doing is we're actually reducing from type to B on the S5, and now we're just looking at this ADS5, and we're actually integrating over the sphere. Now we know in type to B, there is a sort of topological coupling, which is F5, C, uh, C2, D, B2, DC2. Some coupling, a 10 dimensional. Thing, and now we're integrating this over ADS5 times S5. And we all know that in, in, in uh, this solution to type 2B supergravity, there is five form flux on the S5 sphere. So in fact, this coupling in 10D, we can integrate over the S5 and note that the integral of the S5, oops, of S5 is in some nice normalizations, effectively n, and that's the n of the SUN. It's our color n. So what we're getting is some sort of coupling in 5D uh, is sort of an ADS 5n b2 bc2. Coupling, right? So here, this is the uh, F5 is uh, the five form flux, uh, so that's all R flux. This is the NS NS two form, and this is the RR two form. So we're getting this sort of topological coupling. And one way to argue this is that this is sort of an interesting coupling. It's really the leading term. It's, it's like if you actually do sort of an expansion derivatives, this is a linear and derivatives term. So even all the kinetic terms will all come later in that expansion. So this is the term that we want to look at. And actually, this is a term that I already discussed I don't know, in one of the earlier lectures, where I was saying, well, if you have a one-form symmetry, it has a two-form background, if I gauge, I can think of it as an operation in a one-dimensional higher space, where these are now the choices of backgrounds, 
um, either electric or magnetic, and that's exactly what happens here. So what we should think of is we have sort of this bulk ADS, five, and here this is the boundary, here's the CFT4 living, and now we are actually asking ourselves if we have in the bulk this, this theory, what actually can we say about the types of operators, topological operators we can write down now in terms of symmetries and what, what sort of boundary conditions do we have to impose on this boundary? So first of all, in this, this is the BF theory. For basically a ZN, for ZN, uh, one, uh, uh, ZN uh, background fields. I shouldn't write the end for the end field. Because here in the bulk, there's little dynamical fields. So maybe I should put even little b and little c. Anyway, so I can write down here two types of topological operators or two types of surface operators on some manifolds and two, which are, let me call this here b, is e to the integral b2. And Into integral C2. And what you can actually show by looking at sort of the, 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 the theory here that these two operators now in the bulk, so these are surface operators in a five dimensional thing, so they will actually do exactly what we discussed in the first lecture, they'll do some non trivial linking. So in fact, if we do something like uh, we, we insert them in some bulk correlation function, it would like be. Um, B2C, N2, uh, then there's a phase, which is the linking of M2, N2 over N, and times the reverse order. Okay. Oops. So these are non-commuting surface operators that we have in this ADS space. And now the question is, what, can, what sort of things can we do with them as we push them to the boundary? So B2 couples, it's the NS and S back, uh, uh, field, two form. This couples two strings, and this will couple to D1 strings. So N is fundamental, and this will couple to F1s, and this will couple to D1s. Okay, so what are now the consistent sort of things we can do? So we can impose boundary conditions on this four-dimensional bound where the CFT lives at uh, the, the CFT boundary. And the first question we can ask is if we make both of these, um, say, Neumann, so they just become surfaces in the four-dimensional theory, then we hit this problem that there are surfaces, and if you insert them into correlate, they have, they're actually mutually non-local. This isn't a good thing. So in fact, we need to pick, again, boundary conditions, so that what we get, at least in the, in the, in the boundary theory, is, uh, is sort of sensible. So one choice of boundary conditions is you put Dirichlet boundary conditions for one of these, say um, B to B, and Neumann boundary conditions for B to C. So what this means is that we actually have this picture again, and now we have these surfaces that, so let's, these are orange, so they actually will end, and they'll sort of stretch into the bulk, but this is sort of the boundary, so the boundary of M2 is inside the, the M4, our space-time. Whereas the imposing Neumann on the other guys, so we actually saying they're actually becoming surfaces inside here, so they're completely submerged, so M N2 is contained in N4. So 
This is now a fundamental string that has a boundary. It's like an open string that has sort of ends on the boundary and has a world sheet that goes into the bulk. In fact, this is something we would identify in holography as a Wilson loop. And this is now actually still a topological operator. It's a surface operator. in four dimensions. And because of this relation, this actually will non-trivially link with this line. So in fact, there's a non-trivial linking between N2 and the boundary of N2 in, in N4. And that's precisely calculating now the charge so this calculates, this linking computes the charge of a Wilson line um, under the one form symmetry generator which is now given in terms of D2, uh, C, and 2. Okay, so if you actually have a holographic dictionary and you really want to be precise, then you have to actually not just say, ah, I have an N equals to 4 super young Mills theory with SU and gauge group, say, and it is, then, that, then to specify that, you actually specify also boundary conditions for these topological operators. Now, of course, you can change this. You can switch these around, and then basically these guys become the Toft loops, and these become the generators of the dual one form symmetry. But it's all encoded in this BF theory. So the mantra here is if you have, this is not any kind of theorem, it's by evidence, if you have a bulk. If you have some holographic setup, and let's say it's, you know, you have a, some, I think you can even start with just um, a D plus one dimensional, it can be as simple as a D plus one dimensional supergravity dual to, to a, QFT V in D dimensions. I, I don't need a full thing. And then you truncate, look at the topological coupling. For the form fields. And then they should have some interpretation in terms of this theory that governs the symmetry defects. Because from this coupling, where you have BF type coupling, in supergravity, we'll call them Charles-Simons couplings, um, very confusingly. Anyway, so topological couplings such as BF coupling. So you have some integral over D plus one dimensions um, of some B P plus one like DB D minus P. One. So these will be the backgrounds for a P-form symmetry and its dual GP, GD minus P minus two form symmetry. Right, this is the hat group. So these are billion, but it can also contain, in general, not just these type of topological couplings, it can have also polynomials of these background fields, some functions of these B, Pi, so some uh, combination of um, BPIs in some polynomial form. Some. And then the, the statement is you should be able to, this topological action, this should be, you should have, this should have 
this action should have the interpretation of the B plus one dimensional T two F T, which admits Uh, boundary conditions, in fact, topological boundary conditions, uh, such that uh, it's such a they fix the symmetry structure. Can I ask a question? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so you told us that there is something that goes wrong if we fix Neumann for both of them, in the example mm -hmm. you mentioned before. Is there something wrong even also if we fix Dirichlet for both of them? Uh, I think um, I think you can have sort of both of the so then you would have sort of some like you have two you have both a Wilson and Toft line, right? Um, maybe you could have so then I think you can have some other combination that then would right so you maybe you're imposing something like a diagonal so you you sort of, uh, looking at some subset things. So you have both of them ending. Um, and it could be like a dionic line, and then you have some mixed um, thing. Okay, actually, this is a good question. I don't think there's anything completely wrong with that. Um, so what you can, for, for example, always do is uh, also gauge some, some sub Part, right, but you're saying uh, you have Dirichlet for both. For both, um, I think you basically then have uh, Wilson and Toft lines, and I think they would then still also have this kind of, yeah, right. So they would still have a non-trivial linking in 40, right, and then you would insert them into your correlators, and then. They, you switch them around, and I guess you would pick up the spade again. And then that's inconsistent. What you could do is have a Wilson plus Toft, like you know, for SU2, you could go into SO3 minus, where you have a dionic line, and that, that you could do. But I don't think you can just impose both of them, because then you will have line operators that will have non trivial linking. Because somehow they would link in the bulk, but That's not right. in the bound, or something like that. They will actually link in the bound in the in the 40 theory. It's sort of the statement: Why can't you have Wilson lines and Toft lines in the, in the gauge theory? It's because both of them are. It's like this non-mutual locality. If you have the full set of lines, so in my first lecture, this argument: If you look at SUN, you have Wilson lines and Toft lines, and now if you had both of these sets then you could exchange them and pick up exactly a factor like that in correlation functions, say. So that's a problem. So you have to pick a polarization. And what essentially this choice of different boundary conditions is, is a holographic dual picture of what is the choice of polarization. So different, right, this is again a vanilla boundary condition. The different boundary conditions where you switch them around, if n is not prime, then you can even gauge subgroups, right? Have partially some of them be Neumann and Dirichlet, so you can have mixed things. So there's a lot of choice, and that's exactly mirrored in terms of what kind of polarizations you have in this lattice of line operators. Okay, thanks. So this choice of, of boundary conditions. For the B and C are encoded in how do you write the the B fee, the BF ah, term? So I'm I'm just saying so it's the BF term. But you, you could have written plus, you could have written. Yeah, I can write. For example, in this particular case, I would say that um, delta B two is zero on the boundary. Right. Uh, B two is zero on the boundary. Say, it just but ends. Typically, you can track this to a precise boundary term. So maybe yeah, if you so have I written add, C two D B two, um, an M four term. Where I just uh, say that I have a delta function of b minus 
be. So then, okay, not my notation is reversed, but I just fix it to a particular value, the b. Right. And then for the c, I will have to have, uh, I'll just leave it fluctuate, and just remain, it just restricts to the. So I guess my question was, if you had written the, the bf term as c2 db2, yeah. the difference is just the boundary term, and if this boundary term is just making this exchange of in Dirichlet and boundary, if you, you were referring to. Yes, you could also encode it in there. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, and in modern parlance, we would call this the symmetry, T topological field theory. I mean, we use TFT all the time. So symmetry TFT, or simply sim TFT. And this is really in, a billion, in the case of a billion symmetries with some type of anomalies. That's precisely what it is. It's somewhat coincidental, but this is what, what comes out of the examples that we have seen. So I'll give you one example. Um, which is the one that we had at the end of last lecture, which is just to give you a flavor of how this would work and how you then can encode also non-invertible things. And the many examples of these duality defects that here the CSAC group has worked on, Francesco and students and other people, um, on, on, on actually constructing these holographic couplings. And I'll just give you one example. So an example is, And this is something we worked out with Fabio Prozzi. Um, Van Beest, my students, Van Beest. Uh, Dowie Gold, who is in the second last row. And uh, myself. And then in a follow up with uh, Prozzi. Ibu Ba, Bonetti, Federico Bonetti, a lot of Italians in this, Bonetti and myself. And this is simply the dual, and this is not a conformal dual. So, so for n equals four, this is all you have. And then maybe there are couplings to the duality backgrounds, right? And that's also what was discussed in these duality defect papers. But um, so it's really important to have all the couplings for all the symmetries, and that's sort of tricky to write down the symmetry TFT for your holographic dual. So it's a dual to um, 40 n equals to 1 to the angles with S U N. And this is, of course, known. This is the uh, Klebanov Schlassler. And the interesting thing is, if you look at Klebanov Schlassler and you restrict to the topological terms, You have, you will see that you get something, um, right? So there should be background fields for the one form symmetry, so some B2s and C2s. So these are the one form symmetry backgrounds, right? Because it's pure super young girls. And there should also be backgrounds A1 and it's dual C3 uh, for the, uh, it comes from the U1R symmetry and then get broken to Z to N. And then there should be this anomaly. And then the anomaly was the key to getting that non-invertible symmetry going. And so now what you would like to see is take this level of trust for solution. In fact, what we have to do is look at the full consistent truncation, which was a massive effort by uh, Kasani and Fido. And so what we did is extract out the topological couplings, and here the sim TFT is precisely, it's a little paraphrase, I'll, if you're interested, I'll give you more details. So it has these couplings plus um, and 2n a1 dc3 plus a1 b2 squared coupling, which is precisely the BF couplings. This is 
slightly, uh, there's, there's a little bit more complicated because actually um, it's not just the F terms, it's actually BF and Stückelberg, but morally speaking, this is what you get. So these are sort of the BF terms. And this is the anomaly, the top anomaly, the, the imprint of the, the mixed anomaly. And so now what we have to do is play the same game as we did here, write down the topological defects, and actually then this will have these sort of exchange relations in the bulk. And then imposing boundary conditions will pick either the SUN or the PSUN. But we already know this is essentially the same as what we would have gotten by looking at you know, there's a zero form symmetry generator, but it has a mixed anomaly with the one form symmetry. So that guy can't be consistent. We need to stack a TQ of T on top. And so we get actually these non invertibles if we want to have this guy here to be uh, uh, Neumann. So this is basically this in, in, in codes both sort of the invertible. case for SUN, which is um, B2 is Dirichlet, C2 is Neumann, and A1 is um, A1 is Dirichlet, and C2, uh, C3 is Neumann, and also the non-invertible case where we have now B2 is Neumann and C2 is Dirichlet. And this is just to, to tell you that these type of couplings, when you're looking at your supergravity theory, and you'd like to study these types of effects, you need to look at the topological couplings, and from these you can then derive the, the symmetry structure. Okay, so what is my time limit? Again, I can't... Uh... 4.45. Excellent, okay. So I would like to ask whether there is a question regarding these sort of, this is just to, I thought it was useful given that many people are thinking about holography to at least connect a little bit to that. But I want to actually return to field theory and discuss now something about these higher charges. Questions? This is all clear, good. So in the last 45 minutes, I will now return to our more field theoretic perspective and discuss uh, what we'll call Q charges. And that's sort of just generalizing what are the properties of things that transform under generalized symmetries. And that's uh, in this paper that, that actually uh, appeared recently with Laksha Bardwaj. And there are two other papers that are upcoming. So we just discussed the invertible, invertible symmetries and that's already an interesting thing. And then we'll also discuss non-invertibles. And there's also a paper by Bolimo Barch and Rigoletto. I think Rigoletto was a student here of Powell's. Okay, so what is the idea? The question is, given a, um, we've talked a lot about these topological defects, and you know, some D minus P minus one, G generating a GP P form symmetry. And when we had these invertible things, in fact, here we will focus on invertible symmetries for the moment. Uh, the statement is always these p dimensional, the, the, the objects that are charged, the charged objects are 
So this is, this is uh, the charged object are uh, representations of GP. This is sort of the standard law. Yeah, so you have a zero form symmetry, point operators are in representations of the zero form symmetry. You have a Z21 form symmetry, they'll be, you know, in Z2 representations of that one form symmetry, the line operators. And what I actually would like to make the case of this is sort of just so in, in this paper with Lakshan, we showed. This is just a part of the story. The, the, the representation or the, the charges um, under uh, GP higher form symmetry. And namely, so what I want to define is basically, um, if you have a higher dimensional operator, so a, a generalized charge I something that's charged on a generalized symmetry uh, of a p-dimensional operator uh, or actually Q dimensional operator very Q dimensional operator is called a Q charge. Right? Just in the same way that if you have a you know, standard zero form symmetry you say ah oh, this point pi is actually this local operator is charged, it carries a charge. These are now Q charges. They are like higher dimensional things that are charged on the certain symmetries. And now the question is, given a symmetry, what are actually all its higher charges? And we'll just basically focus on zero form symmetries. And there are this uh, interesting story coming out of this. So the question is, what are the Q charges. So for example, for G0, zero form symmetry. Okay. So essentially, um, one way uh, we can look at maybe again the example that's been carrying through this whole series of lectures is, uh, let's look at the U1 gauge theory in 40. And essentially, we, we know there is a Z2 charge conjugation symmetry. So this is a zero form symmetry. And we can ask, what actually are the charges under this? Um, so one thing that we can say is, well, it, it certainly acts a goes to minus A. And so it will act on local operators also. And F goes to minus F. We're actually interested in these higher charges. So actually, how does it act on line operators? If Q is equal to 1, what are actually now the, the how does it act? So we know the Wilson lines. Remember, these are just e to the integral A. So W alpha is e to the, e to the this will just go to W minus alpha, except when alpha is equal to zero or pi, then it's invariant. And likewise, we know this is a theory with one form symmetries. So it has these topological defects Let's just focus on the electric guys. So these are um, A comma electric. These are E to the integral star F. And of course, they will just go to 
d2 minus a. And so they are going to be mapped into each other. Uh, minus, minus, minus. It's a minus of this. Okay, so there's an action on also the magnetic thing, so the top lines will also go to minus one thousand. Uh, the magnetic one thousand. So from this example, we know a zero form symmetry, of course, also acts on everything else, right? So usually we would call then a particle that transforms in a representation of the Z2 as some kind of operator. It can either have trivial charge or non-trivial charge. Right? So there are, of course, also zero charges, if you like. So you can write down F goes to minus F, and now you can construct uh, operators. But the, the question is sort of, how do we actually characterize this sort of structure? So clearly, G0 acts on extended operators, or can act on, act on extended operators. I, there exist these types of Q charges. And now I want to actually ask what is sort of the structure that we should be uh, looking at. So what is actually, what is the structure underlying this? Right? This is like saying, oh, I have a group, and I can write down all its representations in this kind of way. This is sort of the level that we've discussed. And I want to know, what is the representation theory? Cool. So let's look at one charges. So one-dimensional defect of G0. That's the first thing. So what actually is the picture? Uh, so we have a, this is the D, uh, D minus one G. So this generates our G0. And a one charge is a line operator. And when it acts on this, Essentially, what it means, I hit this, I can't go here through, okay, so maybe I go behind, and then it comes out on this side, and here I start with one operator O1, and here it can act with G times O1. Right, that's what happened here. W alpha went to W minus alpha, as I had this topological defect, right? It's just acting on this line operator, maps into minus itself. Okay, so that's sort of one thing. And now what I actually am interested in is first, well, there are also potentially group elements that just stabilize this. So it just maps this into itself. So let's say actually, let's call H sub O1 the stabilizer. Of O1. So basically these are all the, the H and G such that H01 is O1. And so essentially, one thing that if I have such a situation, and this line operator goes in and it comes out, so it's O1, O1, then really, there's a point where these two intersect, and there's locally now some sort of group that, that sort of localized here. So this is some stabilized, there's some H, some, uh, let me put this here. So at, at the intersection, at O1, intersected this D, D minus 1G, and we have um, essentially induced a group symmetry, which is generated by point operators in H, H with H and H one So all this is saying is because this leaves it fixed, I can also think of it as that there's now a, a local sim a symmetry that's induced on this that actually is H01 work. Okay, so basically, let me repeat this. So there's D0H, with H is in H01. 
um, at zero form symmetry. at the intersection. So if I now actually have, for example, um, two of these, I can ask, here's our line operator that goes through here. Uh, so a one, a one. Then I can ask whether these guys um, so here is some D0H, and some D0H1, some D0H2. But these are D... Right, so here these are zero form symmetries in the bulk that we started with, but in with the HI inside the stabilizer. That one, that's why the line operator doesn't change. But now locally, I have these induced zero form, these point-like operators that generate a local zero form symmetry. I can ask, when I now collapse this picture, is there any kind of choice I have? Um, this is just sort of like, I can just multiply these. And in fact, I can sort of say, if I collapse this picture, it becomes sort of D, um, well, one, but now there's a choice, so here we have again D0, H1, H2. So this is just group-like, but there's a choice, H1, H2. And this is exactly similar to these co-cycles that we talked about this morning, that I have a choice of a phase here, and it needs to be consistent with, you know, associativities and so on. And so in fact, the sigma H1, H2 is a choice of co-cycle, Sigma n at h2 of h one u1. Okay? All right. So now I want you to pause for a moment and say, well, I've seen this before. And you've seen this basically this morning. What I'm what basically I reconstructed here is something that we discussed this morning in a slightly different context. So we have some subgroup. That's a stabilizer of this line, and that's a subgroup of G. And then I have a choice of these two cocycles, sigma. I have to call them omega because I called them omega this morning. And so I have a pair of subgroup and omega on this subgroup. So basically, these type of one charges are characterized by a subgroup H and omega and H2 of H comma U1, where H is a subgroup of G. And this we have seen this morning. This is exactly what I called this morning a two representation of G, right? So we call, I know if you have not seen this before, this is probably a lot of two representations for a day, but it's the same thing. So this is basically a recall, this is exactly a two representation of G. This is how I said this category of you know, defects, when you gauge the zero form symmetry, these are precisely forming two rep, and that's precisely what they were characterized by. These were the TQFTs. This was basically the spontaneous symmetry breaking part, and this was basically the part that was like the SBT phase. Right? I see puzzled looks. So let's recap. We ask ourselves if I have a zero, yes, question? Yes, I, I have a question. The co-cycle, is it something that we choose or is it something that we compute in the theory? It's fixed in the theory, you have to compute it. I think it's given a, no, no, so it, the, the setup is 
you have a zero form symmetry. And then I'm saying, what are the possible one dimensional objects, one charges, that are charged under this zero form symmetry? And then the answer is everything that has this property. So you will have, if you have co cycle, and you say, I'm not going to do the example with a co cycle, but for Z2 times Z2, you would have non trivial one charges associated to this co cycle. So the statement is you will then have line operators that will be labeled precisely by, say, a Z2 times Z2 subgroup and a non trivial Z2 co cycle, Z2 times Z2 co cycle. So it's, it's like saying, I have a group, and then I have representations of that group. And you're asking me, uh, do I compute the representations of this group in, in the theory, or are they given to us? So it's like, um, here I'm answering the question, given the group, what are its representations? Given this zero form symmetry, what are its one charges, i.e. its representations on line operators? But for instance, if I take uh, young males and they look at the lines of young males mm -hmm. and they have charge conjugation mm -hmm. or yeah, maybe yeah. some larger do, group, maybe Z2 is not enough. I will but do this exact okay, example. So I can compute for the lines what is the co-cycle, given the lines of young, the Wilson yes, line of I young can, males. Yes, I can definitely uh, determine which, which, higher, which to one charge it should be. It, it will cause one. I will write this down for you in a moment. So this would be... And I did all the prep for, I only did it for Z2, because as I said, for Z2 times Z2, we would be still here writing down this, the, the full category from this morning. I don't think that would be in anyone's interest. But we, can, we can look at it in the paper, and this, uh, we can actually see. I actually haven't looked at the Z2 times Z2, but that might be very interesting. So uh, let's uh, look at the example when G is Z2. Right, and let's recap from this morning. Right, so H can either be one or Z two, and this omega is basically zero in this case. So this is not answering the question, but now we're looking at this example. So we have a zero form symmetry, and so let's say so. What are now these 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 uh, higher charges? So maybe I want to introduce one more piece of notation. I'll label these, this, this by rho. And that because this is now a two representation with two. So one charges are two representations. OK, so now for Z2, we have which rho twos? Well, that's the one with the trivial H and Z2 and, and, and sigma omega is 0. And the Z2 one, which is H is Z2, and again, omega is zero. So this was the case where we had um, case and we had an example there. Now we, let me identify which one is what. That's maybe the, the best example way to do it. And in fact, it's right over there. That was an example where we had a Z2 charge conjugation, and we would just like to now know what are not in terms of these, these two, two representations, um, uh, how to identify these. So essentially we had the line operators W0 and pi, W alpha unequals to 0 and pi, and then we had also these, these uh, A comma E, uh, surface defects, right? So these are really, for Wilson lines, somehow I always like to use W. Well, these are, these correspond to lines, and these correspond to O2s. I, I didn't say they had to be topological or not topological, they're just surface defects in the theory. These are surface defects in the theory. Okay, so what have we got? So this one here is, right, so the zero and pi, well, these are fixed, the stabilizer group is, a, is Z2, so these are basically of this type. So these are rho Z2, uh, 2. And these ones here, right, I had basically the only, so basically the, the only thing that sort of I can now write down, these were basically uh, the stabilizer group is trivial, and it acts, the group actually acts between these. 
These ones here are, again, they're not invariant. One has to actually look at uh, the, as a similar sort of argument now for the surfaces, d2a plus d2 minus a. And these would be now three representations um, associated to sort of a trivial stabilizer group. So this is now sort of the surfaces. Right, we get very similar to what we did there, three representations. Okay, so the general statement is, if we have a zero form symmetry, I would like to know its representation on the higher dimensional defects, so the, the higher charges of zero are higher reps. And more specifically, one charges by line operators or two representations. And two charges are three representations, or Q charges, or Q plus one representations of G0. And we can, of course, also now replace G0 with GP, and that will just follow through even for higher groups. So this is the sort of general statement of if you have a, a symmetry, an invertible symmetry, uh, how do you actually construct the extended operator and how are they transforming under the symmetry? And then this is the answer to that. And I agree with you, it, it's interesting to look at the case with, with, with the co-cycle, you get an even more richer structure, more defects. Yeah. So is this uh, choice of co-cycle, I mean, choice, I mean, the co-cycle related to the G anomaly, the anomaly of G0? Because, okay, if you have an anomaly for the G0, it means in some sense that uh, G0 acts, acts projectively, in some yeah. sense. Mm -hmm. Then I would expect well, that uh, you cannot find the trivial uh, and whatever it is, Q representation, Q plus one representations. So, yes. like in this case, for example, you get the projective representation, no? In uh, on the on this on this local operator. Exactly. So, it can, if if I think of these local operators as small vector space, uh, it cannot be one dimensional. You can you, you have. Uh, it can be actually higher. So, I will discuss. Maybe you're referring to the case when, in fact, there's a little bit more happening in the sense that that's not the full story. And indeed, this is true in higher dimensions. For line operators, this is all there is. But for surface operators and higher, there can be actually more interesting effects. But so my question was, uh, is it possible to have a non-trivial co-cycle, but a trivial anomaly for G, for the zero form symmetry? Yes, because I think I can, I mean, it's literally, all I'm saying is, if you have a Z2, for example, Z2 times Z2, and you're trying to construct all possible line operators, mm -hmm. then part of some of these will have a non-trivial two-core cycle. Oh, okay. Right? That's the, that's the, you, you're thinking theory. I'm thinking symmetry and its representation. Right? When, you are, when you're reading um, uh, Fulton Harris, okay, you I don't ask, oh, is this now actually the representation that is realized in the theory? You're not doing that, right? You're saying, ah, this is the representation of a Lie algebra. And that's the general structure. And here I'm saying this is the general structure for Q charges, meaning Q dimensional operators, under even vanilla invertible symmetries. Okay, so I should ask something like, does, is there an operator which has the trivial co-cycle instead? Which is like saying, uh, do you have yeah, something? There is, right? Because there are also, 
even for the for Z2 times Z2, you can pick a trivial co-cycle, right? Because this group is I don't know, Z2 or something, and then you can pick it trivial or non-trivial. This is a choice of what is the set of possible representation, two representations or one charges of a theory with a zero form symmetry. I have like saying I have an SUN gauge theory. Um, what are the representations that matter can transform it? Okay. It's the answer to that kind of a question. It's a, you have a zero form symmetry. What are the line operators that I can insert into this? It's that kind of a question and that sort of an answer. Okay, okay but you also now hinted that maybe you did not So for, for a higher, for a Q, bigger than one charges, there is a bit more. There's, there's also what's called symmetry factionalization. And I'll explain what that is, and that's probably the last thing I'll manage today. I'll find it here. So for Q, basically, bigger than one, you can have, so, so basically, so what, I'm, what this means is, in addition to symmetries that can basically be localized on this line, right, they, they come from the bulk, and then there's a localized now symmetry on this. This is induced on this line. For lines, right, if this is a line, there can't be now already something that's living on that line, that's non-trivial. But on a surface, so for example, Q equals to two, right? I can have a non-trivial line already on it. Let's actually let me draw it like this. So this is say our O2. So we have we're looking at two charges. The surface operators. And um, for such things, I can have a non-trivial line on the surface already. Um, so they can exist already topological lines. on O2, right? And these are sort of what I would call localized symmetries. So this could be a, a V1, and I'll call it localized because it's letting on that surface operator. And we have a theory that sort of is a maybe three-dimensional theory and extends out in here. Um, but this actually is localized on this. So this can't happen for Q equals to one. For Q equals to one, this is not possible. Because I can't have, if I have a simple operator here, I can't have some non-trivial local operator sitting there. Then it would change this line. There's no like there's no such D zero that doesn't actually, that, that's sort of, you know, if this is really a simple line, that's actually non-trivial. And that's not coming as an induced symmetry. So these are induced symmetries. Actually, let me also define what an induced symmetry is. Just for completeness. So in contrast, We'll call symmetries induced if they arise from the bulk. So we have some symmetries, we're looking at our the, uh, right, I want to draw the picture like this, sorry, one second. So this is our O2. This is the thing we're trying to characterize. 
And now there's a induced symmetry, which is basically I intersect it with, oh, that is absolutely terrible. Um, okay, wrong angle, try again. Uh, this is a challenge always with these, you know, you try to do this in tick phase. Okay, so I have, this is our bulk D minus one, G, just like these ones here. These are zero form symmetry generators. So these are in G zero. And then when I intersect them with the surface, there'll be some line here. So this is a D um, one. And this is what I call induced. And that's different from something that already lives, a, a surface operator can have a already non-trivial uh, topological line on it. Okay, so now what can happen is that I have a bulk symmetry, G0, and I have a two charge, O2, which has a localized symmetry. So I have these guys, which are purple, and I have these guys, which are red. So these are here localized. Um, and now when I look at the full symmetry, so I will just do purple, um, another purple, so these are coming from the bulk. And now I ask, when I fuse these two lines, right, so this is D1, G1, this is D1, G2, and now the question is, what is the fusion of these induced lines? And D1, G2. May fuse to a localized symmetry. D1 localized. So in fact, when I fuse them, I go to this picture. So I bring these two together. In the bulk, they just fuse to G1 times G2. But in fact, here they could just fuse to something that is um, sort of this line here. So if this were a Z2, um, it, in general, they, this can be a bit more complicated. Let's say if this is Z2, it could fuse into an induced line. A, a, a localized line, so this is localized. Okay, so let me be a bit more clear about this. So let G0 is basically um, what is coming from the bulk. We have G localized. And what I'm saying is that these two may not just form sort of a product but actually, there could be a non-trivial extension, namely that one embeds in the Defoe fractionalized, and that projects out back. So there's some exact sequence like this. So you have a fractionalized enhanced symmetry that happens on this defect, on O2, um, that isn't just the product of these two, with the fractionalized not the product. Like naively, you would have said, I have a symmetry that's localized, I have a symmetry that's induced. If I bring them together, it's just the product of these things. But that's not true. There can be non trivial extensions. And these are sort of characterized by group extension classes G0, comma, G localized. And I'll give you an example how this can happen and in a gauge theory. So I 
Das hat er gerne, hat er sie tun. Zero Form Symmetry. And then, uh, for example, we have in the bulk. Uh, the Z2, um, and we actually construct, this is actually a theory, which is SU4 mod Z2 by Young Nos in CD. And essentially what's happening here is that the two Z2, so the Z20, which is the bulk, this is what I called G-induced, and the Z2, uh, localized actually uh, extend to a Z4. So the fusion of these lines actually is, you can think of this as essentially is equal to I and this is equal to V1 minus. Right, so I times I is minus, whereas in the bulk this was just Z2 and you would have thought these two fuse to give just the identity. Yep. This is because that's right. Yeah. So here, basically, this is coming from the fact that you can think of this as coming from gauging. So one way of understanding this is you can think of this as coming from gauging uh, PSU4, which has a Z2, Z4, zero form symmetry. And you gauge the Z2 and you go to PS to SU4 mod Z2 with a Toft anomaly. And this actually is an example that we already knew from this paper with um, where it was. Leo Bikini and Apur Tivari. Well, actually, this I should mention this because so this is really the first time I've worked with a condensed matter physics. And it's sort of part of the, the, the appeal of this whole field, that it's very interdisciplinary. Okay, so now one other thing that is very, very cool is, now we start with completely invertible symmetries, um, but actually what can happen is, I will finish, don't worry, um, is that in fact you can also fractionalize to a non-invertible symmetry. So even though everything was completely invertible, so this is sort of the last cool thing that you can sort of observe is that even if your, your G0 is Z2, that can fractionalize to a non-invertible symmetry. So in this case, uh, the Z2 can actually fractionalize to the easing uh, fusion category. Right, so this was the category you started with, so it's nice to come all full circle. So here you had sort of two lines at D minus, which squared to one, that's a Z2. But then there's also the D2S squared, which becomes D18 plus E1 minus. So this is the easing fusion. So basically you start with a, with a bulk Z2 uh, symmetry that's invertible, but on a, a two charge, it can symmetry on a symmetry on, on a two charge. It can fractionalize to the easing. Okay, so thanks very much for your attention. Maybe we can take one question before the break. I have like half an hour of questions, no? Yeah, one okay. One hour of questions. Yeah, so, okay, let's go to a break and we come back at five for the informal discussion. Thanks.